we're going we're gonna to start up a different study this morning, and uh, I'm going to leave the occult world for a while. It's just about drained me dead. I'm going to tell you, when you get into that stuff, you start dealing with a spirit, and there is no way in the world that you can be, uh, you can be exempt from that spirit. That's where, the, therefore, the battle begins to rage. And we've got a lot of folks here visiting with us this morning, some folks from Michigan, some folks from Kentucky, and, uh, and we're just glad to have them. Try to get by and let them know you appreciate them being here. All right, turn to the book of Genesis with me this morning, chapter number 6. Genesis 6 and verse 1. The scripture says, it, began, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, and bear children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Father, I pray, Lord, for the gift of teaching this morning now, for the unction and blessing of the Holy Spirit. In thy name we pray, amen. Now, the reason I chose Genesis 6 is because it's one of the most controversial passages in the Old Testament. And the reason it's controversial is because you have two, essentially two basic lines of thinking as you approach the Scripture. Number one. Uh, there's a group out there that teaches that these are the sons of Seth, which would be the godly line, uh, the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah and all of that, the sons of Seth that had uh, intermarried with the sons of Cain. And so therefore, because of this, God brought judgment down upon them. Now, there's a lot of good people out there that believe that. Then there's a group that believe that what's going on here in Genesis 6 are the angels that kept not their first estate that the Apostle Peter talks about coming down the daughters of men and bearing children, and the children they bore were giants, and they're called Nephilim. Uh, one man called attention to the fact one time, he said to me, where in the Bible does it say that angels can have children? And I said back to him, the Lord Jesus Christ was born of a spirit. Digest that for a moment. A human father had nothing to do with his birth. He was begotten by a spirit being and then came into, uh, and then came uh, manifest in flesh. So I don't think folks have really given any thought to that. That is that the spirit world is far and above and beyond uh, superior, greater than the flesh and blood that you're living in right now. But anyway... Regardless of the position that you take, the reason I do this is because it opens up for us an understanding of the Scripture, and that understanding is what we call dispensational. Now, you may be a bit dispensationalist, and you may not be. Let me say this. A dispensationalist has a view of the progression of the Bible and the story and the message revealed in Scripture, which leads him, he or she, into what we call eschatology, or his or her view of the last things on the earth. You cannot separate them. So what I'm saying by that, simply you know, using a bunch of big words, what I'm saying by that is this, that if you are, if you are not a dispensationalist and you do not believe that God has dealt with man according to a certain code or rule or law, then you believe that the church is here today uh, reigning, God is reigning through his church in what's called the, uh, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And that reigning through that church, he's going to bring about the salvation of all mankind on the earth. And there's a lot of people that believe that. All right. That has a direct bearing on your eschatology. Now say, what is eschatology? It comes from the Greek word eschatos, eschatos, which simply means last things. So eschatology is the doctrine of last 
things. What's that? Well, it, it has to do with the second coming of Christ. It has to do with what we talk about the tribulation period. It has to do with what we talk about the millennial period. It has to do with the end times. That's eschatology as far as a dispensationalist is concerned. But if you are one who do not believe in dispensations, you essentially believe that there's going to be a general resurrection, that the Lord's going to come back, and when he comes back, once the church has converted the world, and that's usually the position they take, that when the Lord comes back, that he is going to put the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left hand, and he's going to judge mankind at a general judgment, and that's going to be the end of it. Now, that is, that is, that is the general uh, approach that mainline Protestants take about the understanding of the Scripture. This is why mainline Protestants, we're talking about the Presbyterian, the Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, these churches, they take this view because they are not dispensationalist therefore they have to take a view where this sermon on the mount and the preaching of the gospel that christ preached while he was here on this earth is going to convert the world and bring the world into a, into a uh, into a place of uh, submission to god now there's a conflict going on here and here's the conflict when i look about me right now 2016, we are far from converting the world. Looks to me like the world's converting us. <laughs> right? We're not converting the world. The fact of the matter is, do you know what the fastest growing religion is on this earth? Islam. Do you know how they do it? You say, now they're, they're a peaceful religion. You've been listening to politics. You've been listening to politicians. Get any reputable, reputable history book and go back and read the history after 630-something A.D., 60, whenever it was that Muhammad died. Go back and read the history of Islam, and you'll find out that within a 100 years, they had conquered North Africa, the area of the Holy Land, the area in Italy around the Mediterranean, and they were ready to move into Europe. And they had already taken Spain. The Moors had moved into Spain 150 years, somewhere along in there, after Mohammed died. And all of this was done at the edge of the sword. And that, of course, is the history of Islam. Now, the church, through crusades, three of them, crusades that, were, uh, that uh, originated with the popes, came into the Holy Land to take the Holy Land back away from the Muslims, and they succeeded for a while. Finally, under Saladin, he took it back away from the, the, uh, the uh, what do they call them? The, uh, uh, I forget the name of it, the Crusaders. He took it away from the Crusaders, and uh, it remained in their hands uh, after that. Uh, the church today, right now, the church today is split right down the middle when it comes to its interpretation of the scriptures. And if we're going to teach the Bible, I'm going to try my best to teach you how to interpret the Bible. All right? Now, the interpretation of the Bible is a big word that's called hermeneutics. It's the doctrine of the science of interpreting the scripture. Now, let me say this. Dispensationalism is a man-made structure for understanding the Bible. It needs to be understood right off the bat. It's man-made. But if you take dispensationalism and lay it down next to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the narrative of the Scripture, the progression of Revelation of the Bible, it, uh, it fits better than anything else. It fits much better, much better than anything else. Your view of eschatology, which is definitely affected by dispensationalism or mainline Protestantism, also affects your view as it relates to Israel. And your, and your view as it relates to Israel is very important. The Lutheran Church in America 
has definitely taken the side of the Palestinians against Israel. They have taken the side of the Palestinians along with probably most of mainline Protestant uh, Christianity. They've taken their side against Israel. They do this, number one, because they do not believe in a millennial reign. They do not believe that Israel is going to be elevated to the head of all the nations again. They do not believe that the salvation of, 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 of the Gentile nations is going to roar out of Zion. They do not believe these prophecies. They believe that the church is going to convert the world and that Israel is a stumbling block, a problem with that. And so they're... Therefore, they take a position against Israel. Notice carefully, your eschatology, your eschatology bears directly on how you relate to people and nations right now. Directly. It bears directly on that. And your eschatology comes directly out of your worldview as it relates to what your purpose in this world is. Why are we here? What's going on? Has the church failed? Moon, sun, moon, you remember the Moonies? Uh, I don't know how long ago it was, but 35, 40 years ago, came out and made this statement. Moon said that Christ failed in his original mission when he came to the earth 2,000 years ago. And of course, Moon, Mr. Moon being Mr. Moon, said that he was going to succeed where Christ failed. Now, did Christ fail? Now, there's two things I need to bring before your mind, and I want you to think on these things. Think, think on them. The Lord said, if a man smite you on one cheek, turn the other, right? All right. And that's a, probably most Americans that have never even been in a church house will, will know that scripture. Turn the other cheek. That's become part of our, of our, uh, of our, of our culture. Turn the other cheek. All right. Diplomatically, that's what you should do. By all means, avoid uh, any conflict if you possibly can. What if you, you know, you're going to wind up, uh, you, get in a tr you can get in trouble big time. All right. Now, on one hand, he said, turn the other cheek. But on the other hand, he said, if you've got the money, sell your cloak and go buy a sword. There's not one out of 10,000 Americans that know that's in the Bible. I'll never forget, I was watching Bill O'Reilly, Bill O'Reilly, on, uh, on his, on his uh, TV show a few years back. And somebody quoted that to him, and he was completely taken aback. He had no idea that that was in the New Testament. Don't ever appeal to Mr. Riley for theology. <laughs> now, he can get to the bottom of a lot of things, but... He's just a man. And, uh, but he had no idea. You know why? Because he's a Catholic. The Catholic Church takes an even further view on the idea of, we could call it replacement theology, and that is this. Not only is the church here to convert the world over to Christianity, according to them, they're here to rule the world through the authority of the Catholic Church. And the vanguard for that are the Jesuits who go out and, uh, and, and infiltrate the, the governments of the world and bring them under subjection. Don't ever let it be lost on you that the seat of Rome is in a basilica. Basilica comes from the Greek word basileias. Basileias is the house of the king. Therefore, this, the Pope has three crowns. You don't see them, I don't think, anymore. You don't see them, but they, he, has, he has a triple crown on top of his head. And it represents his temporal authority over the rulers of the world. In other words, every king, every prime minister, president in this world is to be brought into subjection to the Pope of Rome. Now, all that is is just an extension of the mainline Protestant idea that the church is to convert the world and through the preaching of the gospel that the Lord rule, will rule over the hearts and minds of men. It would be wonderful if, if he did. I mean, I am not against the idea of, of, of preaching the gospel and bringing peace to this earth. Hallelujah. But that's not what's happening. That's not happening. 
So if you are a millennialist, whether pre or post or ah, tribulation or whatever, I mean, uh, uh, tribulation, not pre, post, or ah, millennial. I'm premillennial. There are those who are ah, millennial, and there are those who are post millennial. I'll explain that in just a moment. But when it comes to, to dispensations, then we have to come down to the point in the Bible where we say, doesn't it say in the scripture that they suffer, they'll reign with him? And that they ruled and reigned with Christ for a thousand years? And it does say that. It says it in the book of Revelation. It talks about reigning here on this earth. Now, here's what happens. If you are amillennial or postmillennial, you take that scripture and you spiritualize it and say, yes, the church is already reigning. And that that thousand year period of time is simply a symbolical or a symbol, a, a symbolic age or period of time. That's the way they deal with that. I don't take it that way. I take a thousand years to be a thousand years. The, he, the, the Latin word is mill annum, millenniums, where we get our word mill annum. Annum, what would annum be? Annually, all right, a year. A mill annum, a mill in Latin is a thousand. So a millennium is a thousand years. And I, of course, believe that thousand years. Now, when I look at this, I, th I say to myself, if the Lord said to get a sword after he said to turn the cheek, there must be something going on here that's changed. And there is, there is. Because what you find when you begin to study the Bible is that certain people represent a certain age and then something starts. For example, it says in Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John, John the Baptist. But since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man, what? Presseth into it. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. That means that the temporal kingdoms on this earth that are being ruled over by a spirit being that is an absolute rebellion against God that are represented by principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, that with that there is a deadly spiritual struggle going on that you don't see with your natural eye, but it is a real battle nonetheless. Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So this spiritual battle that's taking place is fighting for authority over certain sections of the earth. It's fighting for that. In the Old Testament book of Daniel, which the liberal theologians like to disparage, they say Daniel was, crea was created by Israel for the sole purpose of establishing a non-existent kingdom written somewhere around 300 B.C. That's Graf Wellhausen. That's the school of higher criticism. If, any, if there's any way they can come in and destroy your faith in the Bible, they will. It's German higher criticism. It's what happened. And the, and the sad fact is, folks, that most of the Bible colleges in America are built on that premise, on Graf Wellhausen. But anyway, when you come to this, you say to yourself, the book of Daniel is different in the sense that it names an archangel, the only one named in the Bible. His name is Michael. And the Bible says in the book of Daniel that in the time of the end, that Michael, in the time of the end, the eschatology, the last things, that Michael is going to stand up. And when he stands up, he's going to stand up for the church. See, I'm glad you got me there. See how fast you got that? You're listening. Who's he going to stand up for? Now, there, then there must be an Israel. In order to stand for Israel, there's got to be an Israel, right? Absolutely. And so I believe that the nation of Israel is there in a fulfillment of prophecy, blinded according to the book of Romans chapter number 11, but still, nonetheless, they are there and all of the end time events are going to transpire as they relate to Israel. See, I believe that. That puts me so far different and opposed to mainline Protestant theology for the Lutheran church, for example, who comes along and says that the land of Israel, or they want to call it Palestine. They like to call it Palestine. This is important, Palestine. How many has ever heard it called Palestine? Heard it called Israel. 
It was called Israel long before it was called Palestine. Do you know where the word Palestine came from? It came from Rome. When they went in there and uh, they, in uh, 132 AD, Bar Kokhba rebelled against the Roman occupation. And, and by the way, his name means the star, Bar Kokhba. They even printed, they even, they even stamped coins with his figure on them. They wanted their independence. Israel wanted their independence. And so Bar Kokhba led a revolt against Rome. And, uh, and, and he, he led this revolt against Rome. How long it lasted, but eventually Rome put them down. But in the process of putting them down, they wanted to rid the Holy Land of every Jew they could. They did everything they could to get every Jew out of there. They crucified them by the tens of thousands. And uh, they, uh, they changed the name of Jerusalem to Alia Capitolina. They created a Cardo Maximus right down the center of the city. You can go underneath the streets of Jerusalem right now. I've been there. And you can walk down that Cardo Maximus and you can see the, 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 uh, the stanchions that they've got on either side that the Romans built 2,000 years ago. In the King's Highway over in Jordan, you can go into a church that's called the Church at Madaba, and you can look at a mosaic in the floor that dates back for nearly 2,000 years. You can look at a mosaic in the floor that has that very Cardo Maximus right smack down through the middle of Jerusalem where Hadrian, that's the one who did, did it, Hadrian changed the name from Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of peace, changed it to uh, to Alia Capitolina, the capital, a uh, pagan capital, killed a swine, shed its blood on the altar, de de uh, uh, desecrated the altar, changed its name, drove all the Jews out, and then as a final insult against every Jew in Israel, he changed the name of it to Palestine. And the reason he called it Palestine, because of the ancient enemy of the Jew was the what? The Philistine, exactly. The Philistine. So he drove them out of their land, crucified them, changed the name of their city, turned it into a Roman city, uh, killed a swine on the altar and desecrated it, and then changed the name of the country from Israel to Palestine. So just remember that today when somebody says he's a Palestinian. And by the way, if you want to, didn't mean to do this, but if you want to go back and look about, two, about, about 1920, 1930, 20 or 30, you'll find that they call the Jews in the Holy Land Palestinians. <laughs> and then they changed that, of course, because for political expediency, you know, all that. Uh, and, and they took on an identity, just a handful of them, but they took on an identity of all these people coming into the land, coming, 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 coming into the land. And so now you have a conflict going on between the Palestinians and the Jews, the place that's called the West Bank of the Jordan River, the West Bank, they call it the West Bank, that is an arbitrary term created by the news media. The West Bank of the Jordan River is the ancient Judea and Samaria. All right? It is the ancient land of Israel. It's their land. There is no way in the world that you can change it. It's their land. But that's what the issue is. This is why the this is why the uh, the uh, the Lutheran Church has come out along with other mainline Protestant churches, and they support the Palestinians because they say that they were there first and they have a right to that land, and that these Jews are usurping authority over them they shouldn't have and they should have their own sovereign state. And so, do you know what Israel did? They offered a sovereign state for peace. And you know what they did? You know what Arafat did? He rejected it. They don't want peace. They want to do exactly what Hamas in its, uh, in its, uh, its uh, legal uh, document of creation says, we're going to drive the Jews into the sea. We're going to destroy them. And they're not going to stop until that happens. Now here's where they fit eschatology in, in, eschato in eschatology. Eschatology. Whatever. <laughs> Here's where they fit in eschatology. Israel must be there to fulfill one of the greatest events that's going to take place in the end time. And that's this. They are going to sign a peace covenant 
with the Antichrist. There's going to be a conflagration take place in that area that demands peace. And they're going to sign a peace covenant with the Antichrist. There must be a nation to do that. And somebody's going to have to take sides when it comes to that. Now, the present administration, I don't know if you've been living in a cave or not, but it is not pro-Israel. All right? Uh, the, the one before, Bush's administration really wasn't all that great, and his daddy wasn't that great either. Neither one of them. The fact of the matter is, for the last 20, 30 years, the American administrations have not been that great in their support of Israel. Now, you may not like Richard Nixon much, and I, you know, you've got Watergate and all the rest of that, but I'm going to tell you something about Nixon. Nixon gave them weapons when they needed it to survive. God used Richard Nixon to send weapons over there to help Israel to survive, and I think it was the uh, Yom Kippur 1973, when they, when they attacked them on the day of the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the most holy day of the year. That's a, that's a holy day. And, is, and these Arab nations around them attacked them on that day. So if we take a millennial position that God is going to come back and that he's going to reign on this earth, then we have to do something about Israel. And if I believe the Bible says go by a sword, that completely changes my perspective as it relates to how we relate to people. No longer are you required to be a passive sheep to let someone beat you to death and run over you and take your women and children out here in the street and rape them in front of you and kill them. Get yourself a sword. Now, modern-day sword would be Mr. Smith and Mr. Weston, Mr. Remington, Mr. Ruger, <laughs> Mr. Winchester, Oliver Winchester, you know. Colt, Sam Colt, he does just fine. America, no doubt about this, America has been blessed with some of the finest uh, weapons inventors. John Browning, folks, was a uh, Canadian Mormon, and he was a genius when it came to, uh, to uh, creating weapons. He sure did. Just go back and check his, Google his name, and you'd be amazed at how many weapons that man invented and created and were used in World War I, World War II, and are still being used to this very day. And uh, when it came to the weapons, we've been blessed. We have been blessed. America has been blessed when it comes to weapons. And, uh, and, and, uh, and of course, you understand that the freedoms that we won from uh, King George III, they were won with weapons. They were won with weapons. So... He said, by a sword. Uh, I don't know of any single passage in the Bible that will help you. And I'm, what I'm trying to do here this morning is to give you a broad perspective on the Scripture. I don't know how many people have said, Preacher, I'd like to learn the Bible. Where do I start? All right, get out of the forest. Get on top of a mountain and look at where you were. Okay? Get back and get a broad view. All right? Find out what's going on. Get a broad view of the Bible. This book right here, I was taught, and it's still being taught, that how many of you have ever heard that the Bible, it took 1,500 years to write it? That's standard, 1,500 years. Well, that may not be true. Here's why. The book of Job is 1,900 years before Christ. That's when Job lived. He's a contemporary of Abraham. Abraham, 1,900 B.C. All right. Who wrote Job? See? Did Job write Job? Tradition has it that Moses wrote Job. He may have, but nobody can prove that one way or another. All you got to do is get some scholarly work and read it, and they'll say, yeah, well, could be, could be this, could be that, this, that, and so forth and so on. What do you do? You throw your hands up in the air and say, well, maybe Job wrote Job. <laughs> well, if he did, he wrote it 1,900 years before Christ. The last book of the Bible was written about 90 to 95 A.D. How many years does that make? That's 2,000 years to write the Bible. Now, the Bible covers a, period of, a span of time far more than 2,000 years, but it took nearly if Job wrote it, if Job wrote Job, it took nearly 
thousand years to write that book. Have you ever read anything that was written 1,900 years before Christ? I don't think there's anybody in this country outside of professors in these universities out here that's ever read anything that's that old. And then when they do get into reading that stuff that possibly may be that old, it has to be the Sanskrit over here in India. It has to be stuff like that. It's certainly not English. It's not French. It's not Italian, German, Portuguese. It's got to be one of these ancient languages. So what you have in your own language is something that is nearly that was written nearly, if Job wrote it, nearly 2,000 years before Christ. That's remarkable. Now think about it for a minute. A book that took that long to write, do you think one man sat down and wrote all that? Think about the fact that you got all these different men writing over periods of time that didn't even know each other, yet themes show up in the Bible, a theme of redemption, a theme of blood atonement, the theme of the Messiah, the coming Mashiach. Israel, prominent throughout all the nations, one man called from the pagan world, Abraham, and God anointed him and gave him light when nobody else had light. And through that man, Abraham, the light comes into mankind, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Shiloh that Jacob talked about over there in the book of Genesis 49. Where did all that come? Why is there such consistency? You have one of two choices. Either this Bible is a big conspiracy where we have men who dedicated their life to taking what was written and adding to that and creating all of these characters or the Bible is a book of history and revelation from God. Once you receive it, all the Bible said all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word translated inspiration is theos, noustos. All right, theos in Greek is God. Noustos, pneuma, pneuma, pneumatos. What's a pneumatic drill? <coughs> pneumatic. I used to use a pneumatic hammer, a pneumatic impact wrench when I worked on it as a line mechanic. You know what that is? That's an air, air operated, air pressure. We got a lot of English words, folks, that came straight out of Greek. And so does the medical profession, Greek and Latin, a lot of them, all right? Theos noustos means God breathed, all right? That's when we say when the Bible is inspired, we mean that God breathed that Bible into those men. And the scripture says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. See? So if you believe in the inspiration of scripture, you believe that there's a direct contact between God and the writer of the Bible, which of course I do. That's the only way that you're going to have the consistency that you've got. If you don't have, if it's not God breathed, if it's not inspired of God, then, then there's no way in the world that you'd have the consistency. There's no, there is no uh, conspiracy that could create the Bible. Doesn't exist. Now, the Koran, for example. The Koran, they say that Muhammad, uh, I don't know if he was illiterate or what, but they say that Muhammad did not write the Koran personally, that it was written by his surrogates. All right? Whatever. But here's the thing about the Koran. The Hadith is Muhammad's commentary on the Koran. And all of this was created in the lifetime of Muhammad or shortly thereafter. You're talking about a period of less than 100 years. All right? The Koran goes back and it borrows the Old Testament characters, New Testament characters, when you begin to read the Koran, you say, hold on a minute. That Mary in the Koran is the Mary, the mother of the Lord. This Abraham in the Koran, this Ishmael in the Koran is the Ishmael, the son of Abraham and Hagar. And you begin to find out that, that Muhammad, had he not had the Old Testament and the New Testament, there wouldn't have been a whole lot to his Koran. See what I mean? See what I mean? Yeah. See what I mean? The Old Testament is a Jewish book, Tanakh. It's a Jewish book, therefore being Jewish, and so many of the down through the ages have been what you call anti-Semite. They blame the Jews from everything from stealing children and taking them out into the, into the woods and, 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 and eating these kids and taking their blood to make matzo balls with. They call it blood libel. The Jews have been accused of everything under the sun. I believe that when you get into the business of accusing Jews and demonizing them, 
you are, that, that it's satanic. And the reason I do is because of their connection with the Bible. This is a Jewish book, folks. Romans 9 says the scriptures are the oracle given to the Jews. The oracles of God were given to the Jews. To the Jews. So the Bible is the word of God. Now, mainline Protestant denominations don't believe that. They believe it contains the Word of God. What's the difference, preacher? The difference is this, that where they can find in the Bible that God is actually speaking, that they may accept it as a revelation from the Lord containing the Word of God. But for the most part, they say that much of the narrative of Scripture is only the ignorant interpretation and application of archaic people as, they, as, their, as their religion developed. And that the Jewish religion is nothing in the world more than a religion of a people, a tribal people who lived in this land and wanted an identity and they created this identity and that David never, they never had a King David, they never had a real kingdom, that they were at the crossroads of all these major powers like the North and like the East and like the South with Egypt. And that, that the actual Jewish people were just a handful of nomadic tribes that, uh, that inhabited this land and there's really nothing to them. Believe it or not, folks, that's what a lot of mainline Protestant uh, teaching, uh, that's how they teach it. That's how, they, that's how they, uh, they, they, uh, they deal with the Jews. And if you do that, if you take that position then you don't believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. You believe that it is inspired in the same sense that, that, uh, that uh, 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 I swear I can't think of his name now, uh, the great English writer, the bard they called him, Shakespeare, that it is inspired in the sense that God communicates great truths to us through the writings of these men. In plain words, there are, God communicates to man through Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and all of them. He communicates great truths to us. He communicates truths to us through Mohammed. He, he communicates truths to us through the, through, the, uh, through the Hindu religion. In other words, all of them have a, all of them have a, a sense of the communication and inspiration from God for their religion, for their time, and for their people. This is what creates ecumenicism. This is why people come together today and say it doesn't make any difference what religion you are of. As long as you're sincere and honest in your religion, you're going to be okay. There's a one mountain and many paths that lead up to the top of that mountain. Any man, mark this down, that denies the inspiration of Scripture, that this is God's Word, God-breathed, that man is an ecumenicist. And he's a universalist. And he believes that anybody's religion is okay as long as they are sincere in that religion. That's what he believes. And that's that simple. There's no ifs, ands, or buts to it. That's what he's going to believe. But if you believe it's inspired, you're going to say, I have a debt to the Jew, and the Jew is the source of authority. And I'll turn to them, not only for inspiration, I'll turn to them for my Savior. For he came into his own, and his own received him not. I would uh, suggest to, uh, I don't know if there are any of these young men listening to me right now, I don't know, you know, through the internet or, or hear this later. The first thing I would want to know from any Bible college, Bible seminary, institute, or anywhere that I went to, the first question I would ask them, do you believe that that book is inspired of God? Do you believe that, that it is inspired scripture, word for word? That brings up a big term, plenary, verbally inspired scripture. What that simply means is that every word that you have in that Bible is God breathed exactly the way you've got in that Bible. And that's where it came from. It came from God. You see what I mean? Men didn't put it together. It came from God and you've got it the way God wanted you to have it plenary, verbally inspired, living word of the living God. You'll hear me say that every once in a while. When I, when I start to preach a message, the reason I do want to make a bunch of people mad, <laughs> because they know what it means. <laughs> They'll say, well, that ignorant uh, preacher up there, 
Ha, 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 he believes the Bible's the word of God. Let me tell you something. If you don't believe the Bible's the word of God, what are you preaching? <laughs> I mean, good night. What message have you got from men? I don't want to hear what you say. What's God say? I'm glad that when the church I got saved into, Bill Cardwell was the pastor, and Bill Cardwell believed the Bible was the Word of God, and I never heard him one time correct the Scripture, not once, not one time. He believed it, and that was a good foundation for me when I first started, because believe me, folks, see how green that grass is out there? That's how green I was. I didn't know anything. I had to learn it and get it the hard way. All right, now we're going to pick up on dispensations next Sunday. We're going to start talking about God's progressive revelation to man. Folks, he hasn't finished that revelation. The Lord Jesus Christ will be the one that takes you to the Father and shows you the Father. That will be the final revelation of God's person to man will be when the Son takes you. Yes, sir. They used to put their hand on the Bible, didn't they? I mean, when they, when they, when they took an oath in a, in, a, in a court of law, they put their hand on the Bible. The reason they did that is because the Bible's the authority. The Bible's the authority. Yes, sir. Are you saying that they have to buy weapons that are made uh, in Israel? When they, they, they signed a pact with them? They made a governor a pact with When you say this country, you're referring to America? Yes. Oh, okay. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, the people, there are millions and millions of people in this country that are pro-Israel. And Israel knows it. But uh, we're going to have to change administrations to change the attitude toward Israel. No question about that. But Israel is going to be right smack in the middle of what happens for the second advent of Christ. Right in the middle. Because it's going to be the covenant that they sign with the Antichrist. If they could sign a covenant within a few days, the Antichrist is alive right now. He may be. We'll just have to wait and see. You, don't, you can't jump the gun. He has to be revealed. Yes, sir. Pastor, when you're talking about dispensations. Yes, sir. You hear me talk about the ultra dispensations. Right. Yes, yes, there's nuances in this. We will. Okay. Absolutely, Sure. I'm going, to give a broad, I'm going to give a broad perspective, and then we'll get into some details. You make a big mistake when you start with the details without first understanding what's going on here. You know, you can take a man to a tree in a forest and begin to explain what a, the difference between a, a deciduous tree and a coniferous tree, and he doesn't even know what a tree is. You've got to take him back out of the forest and let him get a good view of what a tree looks like in a forest. And then take him up to the tree and begin to break it down in detail. And that's the, that's, that's, that's the part about teaching. That, that's the part that's, that's hard, is the teaching part. Is to, I firmly believe that you've got to get a perspective in your soul of where you are and what you're talking about in order to understand uh, the details. Yeah, the details. I'm premillennial. A lot of brethren are, are and I'm pre-tribulation. But a lot of the brethren are mid-tribulation. And their, and their post-tribulation rapture, all right? They're brethren, but I'm premillennial. If I took somebody off the street, didn't know the difference between the millennium and Job, 
and started talking to them about, I'm pre-tribulational. He said, what's the tribulation? He said, I've been living in tribulation for 30 years. <laughs> You'd have to explain it to him. Because <laughs> he wouldn't know. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Yes, sir. And the uh, Lord said he'd have to shorten those days. But we'll, we'll get into that. We definitely will. I hope by the time we get done with this, we'll have a broad perspective from Genesis through Revelation of what this book is about. And this is the kind of thing, hopefully, that you can go to and help you understand the Bible. Once you begin to understand it, it comes alive. Amen. It's, a, it's an amazing book. All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. Uh, thank you for coming and God bless you. Brother Brian Rowland, will you dismiss us, please? Sweet holy name of the Lord of our Lord and Savior. We ask these things in the name of Jesus.